Hello everybody. Welcome back to your show, Go to Australia show. In the last two episodes, we have talked about Australia, Australian visas in general, and then we talked about Australian skill visas. In particular, we talked about a subclass of visa we call subclass 189, which is a skilled independent visa. We're going to continue with skilled visas in, in this episode as well, but this time we're going to talk about subclass 190 and 489, which is going to be replaced soon with a subclass 491. Uh, in the past ep two episodes, we, we've explain how, how the visa system works and how the point system works. So today we're going to start reviewing those in brief and then continue with the program. Okay, in our previous episode, we talked about subclass 189, which is a skilled independent visa. It didn't need any state or any employer to sponsor you. You just needed to uh, have enough points, which is a bit high to get these days. So many applicants would need to get some extra points from one of the states in, in Australia or territories in Australia. And therefore, there are some other categories of visas or streams of skill visas, uh, two of which are very famous and popular. And we refer to them as subclass 190, which is a permanent visa, and subclass 489 or 491, which is a temporary provisional visa. Let's start with subclass 190. So what do we need for subclass 190? It is a permanent visa and it is a very good visa to be honest. The only obligation is that you need to go to the state which has sponsored you for two years, live there for two years. And that's not a federal requirement, it's a state requirement. And you can negotiate with the states once your visa is approved. Uh, but let's see how we can get the visa. For this visa, your age should be under 45. So if you are 45 and over, unfortunately, you are not eligible for this visa. You need to have an occupation on the uh, either of short-term or long-term lease. Uh, as you may recall from the previous episode, we have uh, three different lists. One is medium to long-term lease and one is a short-term lease. For subclass 189, you needed to have a, an occupation on medium to long term lease, but for subclass 190, you can have your occupation on either of the two lists. So it's a bit, a, a bit of flexibility here. The next requirement would be to have English. Uh, basically, you need to meet the English requirement by showing uh, that you score IELTS 6 in each band of speaking, reading, listening, and writing, or uh, you can score similar basically scores in, in PTE, OET, TOEFL and other English exams that is approved or it is accepted by the Australian government. And finally, for this visa also, you need to score 65 points. And how to get those 65 points, we're going to review them now, as we did in the previous episode. So how do we get the points? As you may recall in the previous episode, uh, the, main, the main point would be age. How, how do you get points for age? You would see here, if you are 18 to 24, you get 25 points. If you are 25 to 32, you get 30 points. If you are 33 to 39, you get 25 points. If you are 40 to 44, you get 15 points, and if you are over 44, obviously you're not eligible for this visa and you don't get any points. The next point would be English, how good your English is. If you score six in each IELTS band, that's a requirement, you don't get any points. If you get seven in each IELTS band, you get 10 points, 
and if you get 8 in each IELTS band, you will get 20 points. But remember, uh, there are other acceptable English tests uh, that uh, the, the Australian government would accept, such as TOEFL, such as PTE, OET, and CAE. So you don't have to sit for one particular exam, you can try uh, different, different exams. The next item which will give you points would be your skilled employment experience. How does it work? If you have worked in Australia, the, the points you get would be better and higher and I'll explain why. For example, if you have worked in Australia for one year only, you get five points. If you have worked for three years, you get 10 points. If you have worked for five years, you get 15 points. And if you have worked for eight years in Australia, you get 20 points. How about overseas? If you have worked overseas or your work experience is from overseas, uh, that will bring you points as well. And how does it work? If you have worked overseas for three years, you get five points. If you have worked five years, you get 10 points. And if you have worked eight years, you get 15 points. And as you compare the two, you will see if you have worked in Australia, you could get a maximum of 20 points. And if you have worked overseas only, you get a maximum of 15 points. But if you, if you combine the two, you can get a maximum of 20 points if you have worked both overseas and in Australia, depending on how long you have worked. And remember, your work experience should be highly relevant to your nominated occupation. It should be closely and highly relevant. You cannot claim work experience for something irrelevant to your, to your nominated occupation. The next item that will bring you points would be your educational qualification. If you have a trade degree or diploma, you will get 10 points. If you have a bachelor degree or master degree, you will get 15 points. If you have a PhD or doctorate, you will get 20 points. The next item is if you have studied in Australia, but in regional Australia. Uh, as you may recall, we have explained that in Australia we have some areas or postcodes that the government has uh, designated or assigned or basically named as regional area postcodes. Uh, if you have studied in those areas, basically the qualification you've obtained in Australia and you've studied for two years uh, in regional Australia, you'll get an additional five points. These five points from November 2019 would be 10 points. So if you have studied in Australia, that will give you five points in itself. And if it's in regional Australia, that would give you an additional 10 points, which makes it 15 points. The next item that will bring you points is credential community language, which we, we call it as naughty test. If you can pass the naughty community credential language test, you will get five points. The next item that will bring you points is having a spouse or partner. Uh, although at the time you watch this program, uh, being probably being single will, will also give you points. Uh, let's talk about both scenarios. If you have a partner or a spouse who is skilled and who can meet the English requirement, they can give you five points. As an example, if, if you have a, a partner who is in the same uh, skill list or occupation list that you are, their, their occupation is, and uh, he or she can score IELTS 6 in each band or in other English exam tests, uh, they will give you five points. But this is for now. After November, 16 November 2019, the, the point system is changing and for partners who are skilled, you will get 10 points. Uh, if, if your partner is not skilled, but her English or his English is good enough to meet the English ability requirement, he or she will give you five points. So from November, we have two, three different scenarios. The partner can give you five points or 10 points 
or zero points. Also, if you are single from November 2019, you get 10 points. SBA Parramatta measures its value in services through client satisfaction. We help clients navigate the maze of tax laws. We provide on-time accounting, bookkeeping, taxation and self-managed super fund services for small to medium-sized businesses. We've been involved in a number of business startups. Many have remained with us as long-term accounting clients. For more info, call 1300 Tax SBA or visit our website at sbaparamatta.com.au. makes destiny. The next item that will bring you some points is professional year, undertaking professional year. A professional year is a structured uh, training program after your graduation in Australia in certain occupations such as computer and engineering accounting uh, professionals. And you need to undertake this course in Australia and you, you need to have studied in Australia prior to that. If you do so, you get five points. What's the next item? The next item that bring, gives you points is having a state sponsoring you. And how does it work? If you're watching this program after November 2019, uh, which we don't have subclass 489 anymore, we're going to have a subclass 491 visa. For subclass 491 visa, you have been sponsored by a regional uh, area or a state regional sponsorship we call it and that that will give you 15 points and in that case if you on your own you have 50 points and the state gives you or the regional area gives you 15 points uh, which brings it to 65 altogether then you meet the requirement and you will be nominated or invited by uh, the immigration department and will go and get your visa uh, so, the difference between subclass 190 and 489 is that for 489 or 491, the two are very similar, you will get more points from the uh, state or the regional authority, but in, in this case you get a, a provisional visa, a temporary visa. But for 190 you get a permanent visa. As it's totally different. Uh, obviously, everyone would like to get a permanent visa right away, but obviously, permanent visas would require probably more points or certain occupations that is sponsored by, by the states. So let's sum up what we talked about in the, this episode and the one before about skill migration. We haven't completed the whole skill migration scheme, but in these two episodes, we have talked about the uh, more common or more possible visas. We talked about subclass 189 in our previous episode, which is a skilled independent visa. You get this visa and you come to Australia, you can live anywhere in Australia and work anywhere and do whatever you want. Uh, in this episode, we talked about subclass 190 and 489. The only difference between the, these two would be that for 190 is a permanent visa and 489 is a temporary visa. And I must say again, if you're watching this program after November, November 2019, 
we don't have 489 and it is called 491 which is pretty much similar. The difference again between or why one should get 190, one should get 489, why not everyone gets 190. Uh, the fact is that many states would not sponsor you uh, un unless you have certain qualifications and points. They would not sponsor you for subclass 190. And in many cases, you do not have enough points to apply for 190. For example, if in, in the best case scenario, you get 55 points, 55 points only, you don't have any choice but to go for 489 or 491 visas. Uh, so it depends on you and the states that is sponsoring you uh, to see if, if you qualify for 190 or 489. Uh, obviously, the best of the three would be the first one, which was subclass 189. But if you have to use uh, the state's sponsorship uh, points, obviously 190 is a better visa than 489. Uh, but as I said, from November, we have a, a subclass called 491, which might, uh, we might explain it in, in another episode. But in brief, that's very similar to 489 that we just talked about. So that was the program for today, but before we go, I want to let you know that what we talk about here is just giving you general information. Obviously, in your case, uh, each individual's case could be quite uh, different to uh, one another, and we all, all, always suggest that you uh, seek a consultation with a migration agent and clarify your, your situation and find out whether you're eligible for any visa. Uh, please don't just apply based on what I've said in this program. You need to assess your situation. You need to probably talk to a migration agent and find out whether you, you're eligible or not. Uh, and we're always here to help you. You can write comments, uh, provide us with feedback or ask your questions and we try to answer your questions as far as possible. In our next episodes, we're going to talk about other results such as parents, family, partner and so on. So keep watching the show and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.